There we go. Minor technical difficulties, the first time with Zoom webinar. So as I was mentioning, collections were originally held in the university library and in 1960, the first archivist was appointed. In, it's interesting to note that in 1975, THB Simons, the founding president at Trent University and the originator of the Journal of Canadian Studies noted in To Know Ourselves, the report of the Commission on Canadian Studies that there are good reasons why universities should collect, process and maintain collections of original material that is of local and regional significance or that had, is associated with the fields of special interest to the university. And he further noted that some universities such as Memorial, Moncton, Western and Queens had already demonstrated considerable interest in locating and developing the archival resources of their region. By 1981, through the generosity of Kathleen Ryan and the Queen's Quest, the new medical building built in 1907, and now Kathleen Ryan Hall was renovated and made, ex made available for the Queen's University archives. Today, the archives houses approximately 10 kilometers of textual records, 2 million photographs, tens of thousands of architectural plans and drawings, and thousands of sound recordings and moving images. The archives is privileged to hold the records of regionally nationally and internationally significant individuals and organizations from the entire range of scholarly disciplines and walks of life, including historical records for the city of Kingston and the county of Frontenac, which speaks to the enduring town and gown relationship between the university and the communities it serves. The archives lecture has run in every year since its inception in 1983. And this year's lecture is entirely virtual, which is a first for this series in a year of firsts for many of us. However, the virtual environment also provides us with the opportunity to share and engage with more students, more faculty, and more community members. So I'd first like to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker is Brandon Graham. Brandon is the Acting Treaty Research Coordinator with the Treaties, Lands, and Environment Department at the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. The research he conducts focuses on the development of specific claims against the Crown and Right of Canada, the claims he and his colleagues work on are often of a historical nature, involving interactions between the Chippewas of the Thames ancestors and the government of colonial Canada. Brandon is honored and grateful to have received the 2020 Geraldine Grace and Maurice Alvin McWaters Fellowship from the Queen's University Archives. This fellowship provided him with an opportunity conduct, to conduct research at the archives, which contains information relevant to the Chippewas of the Thames treaty history. Before beginning his career at the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Brandon studied philosophy and religion at Western University and theology at the University of Toronto, receiving a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Master of Theological Studies degree, respectively. Our second speaker is Michael Borsk. Michael is a doctoral candidate in the Department of History and the W.C. Good Fellow at Queen's University. This year, he is also a Global Fellow with Harvard University's Weatherhead Initiative on Global History as well as a McMurtry Fellow with the Osgood Society for legal, Canadian Legal History. His dissertation, entitled Measuring Ground, Surveyors in the Geography of Sovereignty and Property in the Great Lakes Region, 1783 to 1840, explores the role played by land surveyors in the creation of the state-backed property regimes in British Upper Canada and the American Old Northwest. Since 2018, Michael has been researching the history of the 1796 Fairfield Chippewa deed traveling to archives around the Great Lakes region in order to piece together the fascinating history of this peculiar document. He is currently finishing an article on the Allen family that explores the kinship context between theirs and others 18th century Indian land deeds entitled, Conveyance Between Kin, Settler States, Indigenous Nations, and the Politics of Property in North America after 1763. He would like to thank the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada the Osgood Society for Canadian Legal History, and the W.C. Good Memorial Fellowship for their financial support, as well as the Queen's University Archives and the Treaties, Lands and Environment Department at the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation for their ongoing encouragement and interest in this project. Our moderator is Dr. Scott Berthelet. He is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Queen's University. He researches the history of Indigenous peoples, the Métis, New France and the Hudson's Bay Company. Scott completed his PhD from the University of Saskatchewan in January of 2020. His Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council funded dissertation is titled Between Sovereignty and Statecraft, New France and the Contest for the Hudson Bay Watershed, 1663 to 1774. 
and examines how French Canadian voyageurs and courier de bois were instrumental cultural bro brokers between Indigenous peoples and the French colonial government in the Hudson's Bay watershed. This project will be published as a monograph with the McGill Queen's University Press. He is a member of the Manitoba Métis Federation, the federally recognized self-government of the Métis people of Manitoba. I want to thank you again for joining us this afternoon in the spirit of sharing, reconciliation, and learning. And I'll now turn things over to Scott to moderate the panel and the questions and answers after the talks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction there, Ken. Um, I just want to say hi, everyone. Um, so I'll be moderating the Q&A today following the presentation. Um, I am going to give a very you know, brief comment, like five minutes or so after uh, Brandon and Michael's presentations. Um, but for the Q&A, so there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you click on that, you should be able to type out your questions and then I'll be able to sort of see the questions. Um, and since we're not going to really take a break, like we're just going to save all the questions till after uh, both presenters have gone. So you can ask your question, you know, even midway through one of the presentations, and then I can uh, sort of look at them after and, and we could ask uh, the two presenters to answer the questions uh, in our Q&A period. Um, I also think I should mention that if some of you are having trouble with um, the screens and, and kind of seeing the PowerPoint and the speaker talk, you might want to mess around with your settings underneath uh, view at the top right corner. You should be able to change it from speaker view to gallery view. And even then, I think you can grab um, the, uh, the portrait and kind of move it around the screen. So hopefully play with your settings if you're having trouble seeing. Uh, because I know no, I know that both of our speakers have some excellent PowerPoint slides that they want to share. So I want to make sure that everyone will be able to see those properly. Um, okay, so with that being said, um, I will uh, go to Brandon first, who I believe is starting us off. So Brandon, if you're ready, um, I will pass the floor to you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the Queen's University Archives for inviting me to speak today. It is an honor and I'm grateful for the opportunity to represent the Chippewas of the Thames community at this event. Although I am not a band member and I'm not indigenous myself, the community has provided me with the opportunity to work as a researcher studying the ongoing treaty history of the nation. I'd like to share with you some information regarding the history of the Chippewas of the Thames and discuss the procedure and purpose of conducting treaty research in a First Nations community and the importance of archival institutions, such as the Queen's University Archives, to this line of work and inquiry. Without further ado, I think it is fitting to begin by providing some historical context around the community. The ancestors of the Chippewas of the Thames are Anishinaabeg Deshkin Zibang the original people of the Antlered River, have lived in the Great Lakes region of Turtle Island for countless generations. The Chippewas of the Thames traditional and treaty territories together span the entirety of southwestern Ontario and far beyond. The current Chippewa Reserve is located in southwestern Ontario, about 30 minutes southwest of London, Ontario. It was established through the Longwoods Treaty negotiations from 1820 from 1818 to 1822. While the original reserve was over 15,000 acres large, various historical circumstances, including a land sale in 1834, have resulted in a diminishment of lands. The current reserve sits on approximately 10,800 acres. There are approximately 3,000 band members with about 1,000 citizens living on reserve. The Chippewa people have a long heritage of hunting, fishing, agriculture, and passing down rich oral traditions. The Chippewas of the Thames also have a proud warrior tradition, with ancestors serving in the Beaver Wars, Pontiac's Resistance, the French and Indian War, Tecumseh's Resistance, the War of 1812, and many other wars historically and at end of the modern age. The community is grateful for the contribution of these warriors. Likewise, the community is grateful for the countless contributions of Anishinaabeg women, 
who have led and served their families and communities in times of war and peace. Unfortunately, the archival record all too often contains less information on the Anishinaabeg woman, but this makes the historical and archival materials we do have all the more valuable. I have chosen a painting of Tecumseh and his warriors at the Battle of the Thames and of Chippewas of the Thames chief Arletta Silver to represent these histories and traditions. During the 18th and early 19th centuries, the British colonial government began strategizing on how to acquire land in the Great Lakes region of Turtle Island. At this time, several treaties were signed between the Chippewas and the British Crown. It is important to note that Chippewas of the Thames's major land treaties are pre-Confederation treaties. That is to say, they were signed before Canada's Confederation in 1867. Although they were signed before Confederation, the honor of the Crown is still upheld in right of Canada to this day. It is within this socio-political and legal framework that, the, that First Nations specific claims are pursued. The major land treaties which the Chippewas of the Thames are signatories are as follows. The McKee Treaty of 1790, which addressed the sale of 5,440 square kilometers of land from regional First Nations to the Crown. The London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796, which were signed on the same day, September 7th, between the same peoples. They ceded 132,000 and 88,000 acres, respectively, from regional First Nations to the Crown. And the Longwoods Treaties, beginning with the negotiations of 1818, followed by the Provisional Treaties of 1819 and 1820, and confirmed with the Indentured Treaty of 1822. This series of treaties ultimately culminated in 580,000 acres of land being ceded to the Crown. Unlike the other treaty agreements to, we have discussed, to which multiple bands and nations are signatories, the Chippewas of the Thames and Crown representatives are the sole signatories of the Longwoods Treaties. As previously mentioned, it was through this treaty process that the Chippewas of the Thames current reserve lands were established. There were also other smaller agreements and surrenders to which the community and Crown are signatories. They include a land sale for settlement, the construction of Mount Elgin Indian Residential School, the construction of a railroad right of way, and a timber sale agreement, to name a few. Although the Crown's honor was guaranteed in all of these, in all of these agreements, in practice, not all of the promises made were kept, and several aspects of these agreements were mismanaged. Historically, community members and leaders were aware of these violations, but had limited option for legal recourse. However, in recent decades, more structured systems have been developed in Canada to examine and adjudicate on the legal grievances First Nations communities have with the Crown. Although this system is far from perfect, the Chippewas of the Thames have been successful in using Canada's specific claim system to submit cases against the Crown for treaty and legal violations. The community has received valuable abilities and resources through these claim settlements, which we continue to develop claims through our in-house research department, which I currently coordinate, and also with outside assistance as needed and depending on the nature of the claim. Thus far, the community has settled three land claims against the Crown through Canada's specific claims policy. The Muncie Village claim settled in 1995, which addressed the unlawful surrender of 200 acres of reserve land for a settler and school teacher named John Carey. The clenched defalcation claim settled in 2005, which addressed the mismanagement of banned funds by a government employee, more specifically by an Indian agent named J.B. Clench. This defalcation or fraud took place in the 1830s to 1850s. And the Big Bear Creek claim settled in 2013, was the largest of the three claims and concerned the Crown's failure to establish an additional Chippewa Reserve in what is now Florence, Ontario, about 30 minutes northeast of Chatham, Kent. The said reserve was promised in the Provisional Longwoods Treaties of 1819 and 1820. As has been alluded to, these claims are specific claims or claims which address the Crown's failure to deliver a specific obligation. There are also comprehensive land claims which essentially entail the crafting of modern treaties, 
Since many treaties were historically signed in the area now known as Southern Ontario, most comprehensive claims are pursued to the north and west of the Great Lakes region. In order for a specific claim to be successful, it must meet the minimum requirements set forth in the Specific Claims Tribunal Act, with, which requires that a clear and concise allegations are to be presented along with a comprehensive legal opinion, which is appropriately sourced and cited. A historical report, which we often refer to as a narrative, must also accompany the legal paperwork along with a full list of documents used in the narrative. If you would like to learn more about the procedural elements of specific claims, the Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada website has the full instructions and they are easily found through a Google search. The document packages accompanying specific claims are often quite large as hundreds of documents and materials are commonly incorporated into a claim. For instance, our department is investigating the Longwoods treaties and the historical happenings surrounding those agreements. There are a wide range of materials incorporated into such, into such a research investigation, including diaries, legal documents, published works of history and archeology, span statistical surveys and financial documentation, maps and atlases, township records, several treaties, passages from our previous claims, and perhaps most critically, dozens of letter correspondences, mostly from government officials. The Queen's University Archives was helpful to me in my pursuit of such relevant documentation. In the future, we would also like to incorporate oral traditions and community knowledge into our claims. And certainly we would like to document what people within the community think and feel about our claims nowadays as well. In mentioning these documentary materials, the importance of libraries and archives, but particularly archives, to First Nations research becomes apparent. As archival institutions hold the documents necessary to piece together the governmental and legal materials required to build a strong and defensible claim against the Crown. Archives also commonly contain genealogical, cultural, and geographical information, which is of importance to First Nations communities for a variety of reasons aside from claims. The online databases, search engines, and digitization efforts of many archival institutions is consistently improving, which is immensely helpful to researchers, especially those working remotely or with limited resources, and is increasingly important to all researchers since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, it is still important for researchers to visit archives in person when possible, because no matter how well cataloged items are, you can always unintentionally happen upon something of significance in an archive. Also, sometimes information such as marginalia is cut off in digitized copies of materials. And furthermore, the face-to-face -face consultation with archivists inside an institution is in many ways indispensable. Building rapport and networking between researchers and archivists is an important part of our professions. And these relationships can assist research efforts and contribute to discovering research connections. It was through this sort of networking that our research unit was introduced to the importance of the Queen's University Archives to our line of work. And I am grateful to have received the 2020 McWaters Visiting Fellowship, which provided me with an opportunity to visit the Queen's Archives and see these materials of interest firsthand. Specifically, our research unit was interested in the Charles Gordon Lennox Richmond Fund held at the Queen's Archives which contains copies of papers belonging to Governor General Richmond, who oversaw the creation of the first provisional Longwoods Treaty. Engaging with documents such as Governor Richmond's papers is crucial to developing a thorough understanding of the treaty making process. In addition to the Richmond phone, a document held at Queens titled Treaty with the Chippewa 1796 is of interest to our research unit as it purports to be signed by Chippewas of the Thames ancestors and to entail an unorthodox land acquisition agreement. Of course, I will let Michael speak more on this topic, and I am eager to gain further insight into his research in this area. It was nonetheless interesting to see this document in person and to meet and engage with those who share a common interest in this alleged land deed. Although this curious document was only brought to the attention of our department relatively recently, we have long held documents which pertain to the transaction in question. 
and knowledge of the original document provides a fuller picture of the types of land schemes attempted by settlers in the Longwoods region. Both the 1796 deed and documents from the Richmond Fonds have been incorporated into our ongoing claims. I would like to share with you how exactly we integrate archival documents into our broader claims narrative. For example, here is a document from the Queen's Archives titled Letters to General Maitland and Major Hillier, Bowles to Maitland, April 27, 1819. To provide some context, this is found in a letter book recording the correspondences between Lieutenant Governor Peregrine Maitland and Governor Richmond and their respective secretaries, George Hillier and George Bowles. The April 27th letter from Bowles to Maitland was written in written after the completion of the first provision of Longwood's treaty. In the letter, Bowles informs Maitland that the Governor General's office has received the, and approved the financing method for paying treaty annuities, and that this information was relayed up the colonial chain of command to Secretary of State Henry Bathurst. This letter is of interest to us for several reasons, but one worth noting is that the first provision of Longwood's treaty was ultimately cancelled in 1820, because of internal disputes about payment methods amongst the British. Although initially, the agreement seemed quite promising. We have evidence that even British officials were unclear about the nature of the cancellation, let alone the Chippewas who stem from a far different linguistic, political, and social tradition than the British. The Chippewas were expectedly not overly impressed with the changing nature of the Longwoods Treaty Agreements and negotiations. And in the spring of 1820, the, Chippewas, the Chippewa chief stated to an Indian agent that they hoped the British had not two mouths but would speedily give them their first payment. Our research unit has put the April 27th letter into a mostly chronologically presented collection of documents and commentaries on the Longwoods Treaties and the history surrounding these agreements. These documents are the building blocks of the aforementioned historical reports, which can be utilized to challenge the integrity of treaty negotiations or demonstrate that the Crown failed to deliver on the terms of an agreement. Our research is primarily focused on the development of claims, though there are many reasons why collecting archival materials and building a community research collection is valuable to First Nations communities. Having a collection of historical documents within the community provides a nation with increased accessibility to their histories. Upon reflecting on my visit to Queen's University, I consider the academic and curiosity satisfying potential of the documents I copied outside of the realms of claims development. I thought of Governor Richmond's general orders, which among other things addresses military crime and punishment, including the governor's punitive perspective on the crime of cruelty to animals. I imagine that a community member could conduct a valuable and interesting comparative study of Anishinaabe perspectives in contrast to the 19th century colonial perspectives of Governor Richmond and his inner circle. Surely there are countless ways in which historical materials can be engaged with inside the community with limitless untapped academic avenues yet to be discovered and expanded upon. We try our best to fulfill the request of community members and to share knowledge interdepartmentally. But we are still in the early stages of formalizing a method or platform for providing the community with direct access to our research collections. I know many of you listening to this right now have a keen interest in public history, communications, and information science. And I invite you to provide suggestions and examples of ways in which access to historical documents can be increased and improved. On this slide here, you can see my colleague Emma and I conducting educational seminars to the community's elementary school students. This is one way we try to introduce community members to our work. One of the tools we use to store archival information is a database and archival software called Community Knowledge Keeper, or CKK. CKK is a British Columbia-based company that specializes in software for First Nations communities. The software is particularly helpful to our consultation unit, which works with corporate and government entities upholding the duty to consult and accommodate with Aboriginal peoples. This process is a legal requirement in Canada. The software also features a secure archival database with an interface similar to those of many archival institutions that we are familiar with. 
There is overlap between treaty research and consultation as knowledge of treaty and traditional territories, history and traditional practices are crucially important aspects of First Nations consultation. My visit to the Queen's archives allowed me to add dozens of pages of documentation to our digital database. I understand that you in the audience today come from a variety of different academic and interest backgrounds, and that many of you are students are just beginning your journey into archival research. It was not long ago at all that I too was in this position, and when it comes to discovering archival materials and record keeping methods, the learning process never really ends. Having said that, I'd like to share with you some tips which continue to help me in my archival research pursuits. Firstly, a careful reading of archival guidebooks, descriptions, and published materials from archival institutions will greatly assist you in finding what you are looking for and give you a better understanding of the organizing methods employed by a given institution. Also, it is well worthwhile to find appropriate research, to find appropriate reference books to assist you in, in your research when possible. Two examples that we use in the Chippewa Research Unit are the Handbook of Upper Can Canadian Chronology by Frederick H. Armstrong, which provides a list of office holders and public officials in Upper Canada, and also provides brief commentary about the changing bureaucratic nature of the province over time. And Deeds Nation by artist and amateur researcher Greg Curnow. This work features encyclopedic entries on First Nations individuals in Southern Ontario from the 18th to 20th centuries including treaty signatories, indigenous women of the region, and pe even people referred to in relatively obscure writings. Of course, part of the joy and reward of archival research is discovering and learning things for yourself, but good reference books provide context and can assist researchers in focusing on their research interest without constantly tripping over details. Though, as mentioned before, one of the best things you can do when beginning or continuing your journey is to visit archives and consult directly with an archivist and reach out to people who share your research interests. Our research unit has benefited greatly throughout the years from these conversations, and we wish to continue these relationships and begin new dialogues in the future. We'll end with some pictures from around the Chippewas of the Thames community. I would like to thank the audience for your attention and your interest in this area of research. I would also like to thank the Queen's University Archives for inviting me to speak and for your continued support and encouragement of First Nations treaty research. Finally, I would like to thank the technical and administrative staff who helped facilitate this event. I hope you have learned something about the importance of archival research to First Nations communities. I have found claims research to be an interesting and engaging career path and a great application of an education in the humanities. I encourage audience members to engage with archives and archival materials, as you just may find something of sentimental, practical, or otherwise fascinating significance. Archival collections demonstrate that there is a rich history right under our feet. It is a privilege to have discovered this through my work with the Chippewas of the Thames, who along with other Indigenous peoples were the first to develop systems of memory, preservation, and history on Turtle Island. Miigwech, thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Brandon. Um, I see we have a few questions that are already coming in. I just want to remind our audience that um, they should feel free to use the Q&A button to ask questions, um, whether it was just from Brandon's presentation that we just heard or from Michael's presentation that's coming up. Um, and I guess maybe in the question too, um, say you could also say like who the question is addressed to, whether it's Brandon or Michael. Uh, obviously the ones that have been posed so far are addressed to Brandon. So no problem, I will, I will keep track of that. Uh, Michael, if you are ready, I will pass the floor to you. Great, thanks Scott. Excellent. Just pulling up my PowerPoint here for you guys. There we go. Play from start. Excellent. 
Perfect. So thank you very much, Scott. And uh, thank you, of course, to Queen's University Archives for organizing this and inviting me. And of course, Brandon for joining me and delivering a great uh, opening presentation. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here with you all today. And I want to share with you guys a little bit of the research I've been doing on one truly unique item that uh, Brandon mentioned that is housed in the Queen's University Archive. So without further ado, let's get talking about it. On April 17th, 1796, the former British Indian Department agent turned, turned settler speculator Ebenezer Allen was named in this deed for land. On behalf of his two daughters, Mary, sometimes called Polly, and Chloe, Ebenezer, who's called in this deed Genutio, was given six miles square of land from the Chippewa of the Thames River, located on unceded territory in the colony of Upper Canada. The land the deed covered was to be shared with four other, quote, native children, Wabagonian and his sister, the children of the Boye family, as well as George and Daniel Lutz, sons of Jenny and Samson Lutz from Niagara. The deed went on to explain that the Chippewas gave this land to their, these families because, quote, all people born of native women have been and are regarded as of the nation and must have equal rights to others of the said nation to the land that belongs to them. It was Mary and Chloe's mother, Kaindate, also called Sally, who was the reason that the Chippewa were willing to grant, surrender, transfer, and give them irrevocably all the land hereafter mentioned. Confirming the deed's terms were 14 Chippewa signatories, identified as, quote, we the main chiefs and elders who recognized each child as, quote, members of our Chippewa nation. The entire affair was witnessed by Francis Xavier Troitie de Belcourt, the public notary at Detroit of the Northwest Territory, who recorded the proceedings and that he retained a true copy of the deed in his office. Now, nearly 200 years later, this deed arrived at Queen's University Archives, which out, without much more providence than what the deed itself told us. What we do know is that in 1973, the deed was found at the nearby Fairfield House pictured here. The house was built in, in 1793 in present day Amherst View, Ontario by the United Empire Loyalists, William and Abigail Fairfield. One anecdotal account shared with me by Queen's University's own archivist, Heather Holm, suggested that the deed was uncovered in a bureau, though it remains unclear how either the desk or the deed came into the Fairfield family's possession. But in any case, it's from here that the 1796 deed gets its name. Yet among the Fairfield family fonds given to Queens by the Fairfield Homestead Heritage Association, the Fairfield Chippewa deed quite literally stands apart. Perhaps to its, due to its rather enormous size, the deed was originally thought to be a quote, Chippewa treaty. And it is cataloged as such under the heading of miscellaneous materials. Besides a name, the Fairfield family papers tell us precious little about the deed itself or any of the individuals connected to it. Now, for my own part, I came across this deed in 2018 in a rather serendipitous way. By sheer luck, I happened to be in the archive the same day that Heather was exhibiting the Fairfield Chippewa deed to a group of fellow graduate students. Eavesdropping, I got to hear a bit about this peculiar document and the questions that it raised. Where did the deed come from? Why was it written in French? Who were the indigenous French and English parties involved and how did they relate to one another? And where exactly was this land and under what circumstances was it granted? Now, lest I seem too lazy, I did come up with some of my own questions as I listened to Heather's presentation. Namely, was this actually a valid legal document? And did the children named here ever receive the lands that they had been granted? When we look at the deed itself, it seems obvious that the document was intended to be legally binding. The opening preamble included below mirrors a much longer tradition of public legal pronouncements found in both French and English law. Likewise, the dotum markings made by the Chippewa signatories connect the deed firmly to the world of Anishinaabe governance structures and kinship networks. In other words, it looks pretty official. Yet scholars have long been skeptical about the legitimacy of these private conveyances between indigenous nations and individual settlers. Commonly called Indian land deeds, the American historian Francis Jennings referred to these exchanges as nothing more than quote, deed games, settlers used to grab land from indigenous nations. In essence, they were nothing more than dirty deeds done to get dirt cheap. In Canada, a much more well-known legal proclamation, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, took an equally dim view of the validity of such conveyances. According to the proclamation's terms, it prohibited the division and alienation of indigenous lands by any power besides the British Crown. It likewise forbade settlers and indigenous nations from conducting any private land sales in either British North America or the area beyond the Appalachian Mountains 
reserved as, quote, Indian country. Yet 30 years later, the very event that the Royal Proclamation was intended to stop occurred on the banks of the Thames River, wrapped in terms of kinship. So in order to understand why this happened, as well as to answer some of the questions that the Fairfield Chippewa deed raises, we need to look well beyond Queen's archives. Sadly for me, there is no file or fond in any archive available labeled Fairfield Chippewa deed answers. It's only by piecing together passing mentions and isolated appearances of this deed and its parties that its meaning becomes clear. Unfortunately, not every party in the deed is represented equally. In particular, the colonial archive does not record many of the Chippewa's voices on this matter. In stark contrast are the many mentions of Ebenezer Allen and his family, whose lives I will use to better illuminate the Fairfield Chippewa deed for the rest of my presentation. Alongside some of their co-signatories, traces of Ebenezer and Sally, as well as Mary and Chloe, appear scattered across seven different archives. Perhaps fittingly in our COVID-19 moment, we'll travel from one collection to another virtually, so that I can share some of my key archival findings that help us to return the deed to its proper historical context. And despite the intimacies of these documents, you'll see that they're actually quite disparate, distant from each other. And throughout the presentation, we're gonna be returning to this map with red dots turning green as we explore each archive's holdings. In the end, my aim is to show how these connections will allow us to actually rediscover the Fairfield Chippewa D, a document that we've known about for a while, but one we've actually only known a little bit about. So in many ways, the history of the Fairfield Chippewa deed begins in the United States with Ebenezer Allen. Likely born in New Jersey around 1752, Ebenezer joined the British war effort in 1777 and was posted to the Niagara district as an officer in the Indian department during the American Revolution. In 1782 and 83, he was active among the Haudenosaunee in the Genesee Valley as connected to Butler's Rangers. Allen's relationship with both the British and the Mohawk soured considerably when he helped the victorious Americans negotiate a peace with the Haudenosaunee by stealing a wampum belt and taking it without their permission to Congress. For that, the Mohawk leader Joseph Brandt coordinated with the British to imprison Allen. For nearly 10 months, he was kept in cells in Kingston and Montreal, far away from the Haudenosaunee as the Treaty of Fort Stanwyck was negotiated. Impoverished after his lengthy prison stay and with very few friends, Allen returned to his homestead amongst the Seneca in the Genesee Valley. According to Mary Jamison, the famous white woman of the Genesee, the Seneca leader, Chief Littlebeard, quote, charged his Indians not to meddle with Allen so that he may live among them peaceably and enjoy himself with his family and his property if he could. And the family that Little Beer referred to was the one that Alan made with Sally and included those two daughters, Mary and Chloe. Unfortunately, while very little is known about Sally, we do know that she was the sister of Captain Bull. Bull was a Seneca warrior who ensured safe passage for Colonel Guy Johnson from the Mohawk Valley to Canada in 1775. He was later killed at the Battle of Erickson, fighting alongside the British during the revolution. It's here, buried in the land registry rolls of Ontario County, New York, that we encounter our first major archival find. In 1791, a deed was signed by the Seneca, giving Mary and Chloe six miles square of land at the site where their father already lived on the Genesee River, right on the boundary where an unceded Seneca territory met the lands under the jurisdiction of New York State. The deed made clear that the land was given to the girls because, quote, every person born of a Seneca woman has been and is considered of one of the nation. The deed also made clear that the land would not be divided and sold by the Allens. In effect, the deed was really a form of lease rather than fee simple title. Now, we could say a lot more about the deed and its terms and what it tells us about the relationship between the Allen family and the Seneca. But key for us to recognize today is the fact that this 1791 deed from the Seneca along the Genesee River shares striking similarities oops, to the 1796 deed from the Chippewa along the Thames River. This is most clearly seen, of course, in the claims to property through kinships that both deeds asserted. Or to put it differently, hundreds of miles from Kingston, the 1796 deed had an elder sibling. Now, initially that 1791 deed was upheld by the American commissioner to the Seneca, Timothy Pickering. According to Pickering's understandings of the United States law, the deed was valid. Like the British, the United States federal government also maintained a treaty system and claimed the right of preemption over indigenous lands. And just like the Royal Proclamation, the American Trade and Intercourse Act of 1790 prohibited private land sales between settlers and indigenous nations. Yet Pickering's reading of American law relating to unceded indigenous territory found, quote, 
there existed nothing to bar a division of the whole country amongst themselves. That is the object of the Seneca's deed to Allen's children, whom they called their children, agreeable to the rules of dissent amongst them, which is in the female line. He also upheld the Seneca's other terms, recognizing that the Allen family were, quote, tenants in common on the land. And as Pickering's comments reveal, his understanding of Haudenosaunee land tenure and matriarchal structures helped to shape his decision. Rather than interminable clash, Pickering saw a way that, made, that he could fit these two property systems together. Another fascinating archival document held in the Massachusetts Historical Society reveals that Pickering's decision was swayed not just by Haudenosaunee land law, but by the keepers of that law in the Genesee Valley, the Seneca matriarchs. In a speech delivered by Chief Kayashoda on their behalf, the Seneca women asserted their authority over the matter, telling Pickering, we do not look to the men among us. They then recounted how they invited Allen to live amongst them, allowing him to join them as a farmer in their clearings and as a partner and a parent in their community. But things had changed. Kayashoda, now they informed Pickering, Allen had become violent and abusive towards some of the children and the women in the community, including Sally. At the end of his speech, Kaya Shoulder told Pickering that the women wanted action taken against Allen. You have heard me tell of ye women. Now they speak to their tribes and wish them to move his seat a little. Brother, now talk with Mr. Allen and make his mind easy by settling this matter in a satisfactory manner. Clearly, again, there's much more that we can say about the relationships uh, exhibited in this deed and the conversation with Pickering. And I'm happy to do that during the question period. Nonetheless, what's important for us to note here is that just below the surface of the deed stated proprietary claims, a whole host of relationships centered on kin and community connections were being negotiated, not just between individuals, but between nations. Now, before Pickering could intercede, the American Secretary for War, Henry Knox, revoked the deed. He claimed that federal law prohibited the Seneca from dividing their lands at all. In fact, he pointed out that the right to grant this land was not even held by the federal government anymore, let alone the Seneca. The preemption right to Seneca territory were now owned by a company of private land speculators, sold to them by the state of Massachusetts after they were negotiated from the state of New York. The details here are clearly confusing, but it's worth sticking with the messiness if just to appreciate the tangle of property claims and sovereignty contests that the Allen family and the 1791 deed were wrapped up in. It didn't matter to Knox that Ebenezer had promised to compensate the land speculators for the land that his grant now covered. And Knox certainly didn't care about the Seneca's opinion of the matter or their rights to the land through kinship or any other connection. Eager to cut through the dense tangle of relationships, Knox overturned Pickering's decision. And it seemed that the 1791 deed was a dead letter. Ebenezer Allen, however, had other ideas. Sometime before 1793, he sold his daughter's 10,240 acres to the American financier and founding father, Robert Morris. In doing so, Ebenezer went against the terms of his deed, violating both his agreement with the Seneca and the decisions of the American government. The only person who benefited as much as Ebenezer from this illegal sale was Morris himself. Today, the lands covered by Mary and Chloe's deed, still known as Mount Morris. Ironically, it was given to Morris by his son, Thomas, just after Ebenezer snatched it from his daughters and the Seneca. And you can see right here in the accounting of Morris's property where that tract is listed. With money in hand, Ebenezer took his children with him to Upper Canada. He was drawn there by a 2,200 acre grant at the forks of the Thames River, near present day London. It seems his earlier misdeeds in the Genesee Valley after the revolution had been forgiven, if not entirely forgotten. In 1794, he was granted these lands as a loyalist in recognition of his wartime service. Though he left behind Sally, he happily took her kinship connections with him, along with their two daughters. And it was here that he put the, those connections to good use again, just as he had amongst the Seneca four years earlier, Ebenezer used his family's indigenous kinship connections in order to claim unceded Chippewa territory, resulting in the 1796 Chippewa Fairfield deed. It also appears that he learned a couple new tricks along the way. This time, his family would not be alone in the deed, nor would they just be tenants. Instead, they would be given full title to thousands of acres that their kinship allowed them to claim. Now, the Fairfield Chippewa's deed's kinship context raises a number of important and unavoidable questions. Why did the patrilineal Chippewa see two Seneca women as their kin who were entitled to a share of their land? Besides the deed's repeated insistence that Mary and Chloe were the Chippewa's children, the rationale of the Chippewa leaders is still not entirely clear. Still, there are clues that can give us some insights into their actions. 
Broadly speaking, we do know that the period after the American Revolution saw indigenous polities reconstituting themselves on new lands with their extended kin across the Great Lakes region. In his now famous 1798 speech, the Seneca war chief farmer's brother remarked that the revolution had, quote, pushed the inhabitants of this whole island into a tumult and commotion, like a raging whirlwind which tears up the trees and tosses to and fro the leaves, so that no one knows whence they come or where they will fall. These shifting resettlement efforts were particularly visible along the Thames River. This map of the region in the Library of Archives of Canada, created by the surveyor Patrick McNiff, shows that process on a large scale. Along, all across the river, new villages inhabited by the Delaware, the Mohawk, and Moravian converts were established alongside pre-existing villages of the Chippewa at the end of the 18th century. Now, if Indigenous nations were using kinship connections to build something like what the Ojibwe scholar Michael Whitkin has called a native new world, evidence of that process can also be seen on a smaller level too, especially in other Chippewa land deeds. In 1781, four Chippewa chiefs granted land on the Thames River to Antoine Louis de Combe de Labadie, his indigenous wife, Mary, and their four children, quote, in consideration of their goodwill, love, and affection. In another instance, one of the Chippewa signatories to the Fairfield Chippewa deed, Chief Okiwe, signed another deed in 1788, reserving land located on the Thames River for Jonathan Shefflin, a former member of Butler's Rangers. Most intriguing, however, is a deed from 1800 that ended up in the hands of the Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs for Upper Canada, William Klaus, and now, in the Library and Archives of Upper Canada. In it, four of the chiefs who signed the 1796 Fairfield Chippewa deed reiterated their intention to grant land to the Boye family. But interestingly, they did so in council with the Haudenosaunee of Grand River, stating, quote, we have chosen our worthy friend, Captain Joseph Brandt. Accompanied with a large belt of wampum, we have given him full power by the honor of the nation to prevent and hinder any persons, white people or Indians, molesting our brother Boye and our children. Now, a lot more further research will be needed to fully understand the link between the Haudenosaunee and the Chippewa presented here. But suffice to say, the Fairfield Chippewa deed was part of a much broader process of territorial negotiations surrounding land that were being organized between Indigenous nations in the late, 19th and 18th, in the late 18th century. And these two hinged on bonds and expressions of kinship. Oops. More than just these individual precedents and ongoing Indigenous practices of land sharing in the region, however, Ebenezer seemed to have believed that the colonial government would also look kindly on his family's arrangement with the Chippewa. In 1798, he claimed in a petition to the Executive Council that the Chippewa were his daughter's, quote, nearest relatives after John Bull, and that they had lost their lands given to them by, quote, the overbearing and imperious management of the land jobbers of the state of New York. When the colony's Executive Council rejected his request, Ebenezer was shocked and angry. After a drunken confrontation with the colony's surveyor general, D.W. Smith, he wrote a letter apologizing and explaining his actions. That letter today is in the Burton Historical Collection in Detroit, pictured here. And in it, Ebenezer asserted that none other than the colony's first lieutenant governor, John Graves Simcoe, had assured him that his deed from the Chippewa would be perfectly legal. Now, it's possible that Allen was being honest and that Simcoe did support his claims. His views might have been conditioned by another famous land dispute, this one involving the Oneida fur trader, Sally and Eyes. In 1782, the Chippewa sold Sally over a thousand acres of land along the Thames River. And that land became the subject of dispute after the 1790 McKee purchase, when the colonial government refused to recognize her claim. The Chippewa had granted the land to Sally as, quote, their sister. And Simcoe, as well as Joseph Brandt, believed that she should receive her lands without delay. Though supported in many of her petitions to the Crown by the Chippewa signatories, her legal battle ultimately came to little and she left her lands without title before her death in 1823. So given the example of Sally and I's, it seems hard to believe that the Chippewa Fairfield deed would be regarded as legally valid in Upper Canada. After all, according to most interpretations of the Royal Proclamation inside and outside the courts, the arrangement violated the Crown's very claims to sovereignty. But another archival document found in the Library of Archives of Canada offers a starkly different interpretation of both the proclamation and the deed. Following the negotiations surrounding the Longwoods purchase that Brandon mentioned in his presentation, Upper Canada's Executive Council was forced to consider the validity of the grants to Mary and Chloe. The entire claim appears to have been prompted because a settler, Oliver Tiffany, purchased a quick claim deed to the entire tract promised to one of Mary and Chloe's co-grantees, George Lutz. 
in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on how the outcome of that ruling affected the Allen family, though I'm happy to talk more about what happened with the Lutz family during question period as well. First, the executive council, oops, the executive council claimed that the original Indian sessions were much too large. But right after that, they confirmed that Mary and Chloe were entitled to retain their rights to the land, giving them sole title to just over 200 acres along the river. The council's rationale, I think is worth quoting here in full, seen on the screen. Now, rather than read it out though, I just wanna focus on its significance within this archival web that we've drawn across the Great Lakes. Namely, that in contrast to the 1791 deed from the Seneca, the 1796 deed from the Chippewa was recognized by colonial officials. Mary and Chloe were found to have a legal proprietary right to their land, one that was traced back to the Chippewa. This was a decision that was fundamentally shaped by the council's recognition of the ability of indigenous kinship structures to shape land tenure, even after treaties were negotiated. The effect of this decision was immediate, as recorded in a survey held in the archives of Ontario, as well as at the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation. And I know she's here today. This was shared with me by Victoria Deleary when I got to visit, I guess, last summer. So in 1821, the surveyor Malin Burwell marked Chloe Allen's lot on his plat of Caradoc Township. Like the deed that we've been talking about, there's no indication in the archives of Ontario of the much wider story that this document connects to or the significance. It's only when we weave these documents together, making one a thread on top of a thread, that we begin to understand the significance of the Fairfield Chippewa deed and the many other deeds done before and after its creation. Now, to end today, I wanna to leave you all with what I think is a fitting quotation from Ontario's first provincial archivist, Alexander Fraser. In his reflections on the writing of history, Fraser wrote, it is only by knowing the life of a people that the history of that people can be written. Despise not, therefore, the day of small things. As I hope I've shown today, it's a host of small things and brief moments in individual lives, sometimes easily missed or dismissed, that make our history much more than just the sum of its parts. It's these archival fragments and these brief historical traces that not only allow us to return the Fairfield Chippewa deed to its proper historical context, but highlight a part of Canada's history with Indigenous nations that has not yet ended. As both the land acknowledgement that opened our session today and Brandon's brilliant presentation about the ongoing research surrounding land claims in this country remind us, the history of the places we call home is always a history of our relationships with one another. And that includes all bonds, past, present, and future. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And I guess I just want to say, um, you know, I kind of speak for everyone in our virtual audience today when I say thank you both, Michael and Brandon, for such uh, illuminating and interesting presentations. Um, unfortunately, we don't really get the round of applause that would normally come, but um, I, I do want to say that, you know, people are there and they are, uh, they enjoyed it. Um, and I think these presentations, you know, are very interesting because they show us some of the material available at Queen's University archives. Um, and I think in a way it kind of helps to dispel the, the myth or maybe at least the preconception that Queen's Archives houses exclusively records associated with the university. In fact, I think if anything, these two presentations have highlighted the diversity of the archival collections, which in many cases document the history of Kingston and the surrounding region. Um, as we've learned from these presentations today, Queen's Archives uh, even holds records pertinent to the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, um, who aren't even really it, uh, from this part of Ontario, um, such as the Charles Gordon Lennox Richmond Fawns, as Brandon discussed in his presentation, or the 1796 Fairfield Chippewa deed that Michael covered in his. Uh, Brandon's presentation um, has demonstrated, I think, how archives and archival collections are a powerful tool and are a vitally important resource for researchers such as himself, who are working with First Nations communities uh, to affirm treaty rights and to settle claims against the Crown. While treaty rights flow from the agreements made between First Nations and the Crown, many of these promises were never kept or were arbitrarily altered, um, as Brandon showed us today. Uh, hence the ongoing need to develop and negotiate land claims which seek to address wrongs made against Indigenous peoples by both federal and provincial governments. Um, the relationships between archives and treaty researchers are crucial for First Nations communities because it not only holds the Crown accountable for these treaty and legal violations, but also helps to uphold treaty rights, which ultimately uh, benefit First Nations 
uh, when it comes to self-determination, governance, uh, and access to land and resources. As Brandon has shown, treaty research and court rulings have continued uh, to shape treaty relations between the federal government and Indigenous peoples. Michael's presentation examined the life of Ebenezer Allen, his wife, uh, Sally, and his two daughters, and their two daughters, uh, Mary and Chloe, uh, which he used to try and decipher the 1796 Fairfield Chippewa deed, uh, which had made its way into the Queen's archives. Amazingly, Michael followed the Allen family across seven different archives before finally reaching the Thames River Valley and the events surrounding the Fairfield Chippewa deed. And I really like that map that, that Michael showed. It really gave us a sense of you know, the archives he visited personally, but then also the, uh, the paper trail behind all this. Um, Michael's presentation, um, I think, raises interesting questions regarding the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Ostensibly, the proclamation was meant to protect Indigenous rights by only allowing the Crown to negotiate treaties and purchase lands from Indigenous peoples. But in this context of gift, gifting land to Indigenous kin, the Royal Proclamation seems to stifle Indigenous sovereignty. Michael's presentation also raises interesting questions regarding how Indigenous peoples related to each other in the era following the American Revolution, where territories, peoples, and kinship networks were being reorganized and redefined in the wake of the violent upheaval of the Revolutionary War. Michael doesn't fixate on Ebenezer Allen as a swindler, charlatan, charlatan or land speculator, but instead he tries to understand the kinship connection between the Haudenosaunee, in this case the Seneca, and the Chippewa or Anishinaabe of the Thames River uh, that may have led them to recognize Mary and Chloe, Allen's daughters, as their kin. Indeed, as Michael has shown, Upper Canada's Executive Council recognized Mary and Chloe's land rights, which contravened the Royal uh, Proclamation. Um, I think this all shows that Indigenous kinship also shaped land tenure in Upper Canada. These are both uh, very promising research avenues that while dealing specifically with the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, also asks us to think about much larger issues pertaining to settler colonialism and, indig and indigenous treaty rights in Canada. Uh, these presenters both remind us that treaties weren't just things that happened in the past. Uh, indeed, all Canadians, whether indigenous or non-indigenous are in treaty relationships. Uh, for First Nations, the treaties did not signify uh, mere sessions or surrenders of land to the crown, but rather the establishment of a nation to nation relationship. Treaties themselves should be understood within the context as being living documents which represent ongoing relationships between Indigenous peoples and the rest of Canada. I want to thank you uh, both once again, uh, Brandon and Michael, for these excellent presentations. And I think now would be uh, a good time for us to move uh, into our question and answer period, which I will be moderating. And I'm happy to see that we have a few more questions coming in. And uh, if we run out of questions from the audience, I also have a few questions lined up for you guys. So. Uh, <laughs> we'll put you in the hot seat now. Okay, um, so I guess we'll just go in the order that some of these questions uh, were asked. Um, and I think I'll be able to share them uh, with you as well. Um, so we'll start with the first question. This is one for, for, for Brandon. Um, so Brandon, this question comes from Paul Thistle. And he asks regarding the submission of oral history evidence in court. Uh, he wants to know, how do you go about demonstrating to the court the accuracy of such submissions? Are there Supreme Court rulings on such evidence? Um, can you see the question as well from your end? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so I, I don't know as much about the specific court precedents as, as, as I perhaps should. Um, I know that in various courts, um, oral traditions have been incorporated in various capacities. Um, I know that the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation uh, right now has a, a case in the courts which um, relies at least partially on um, oral histories and oral traditions. Um, I, I, I should brush up on the, on the more legalistic elements of this, but I, I can tell you one area uh, in claims negotiations where an oral tradition can um, uh, definitely come into play. And that's in regard to um, where traditional medicines or traditional uh, traditional land use essentially let, let elders remember and that elders can explain to you and, and point out the value uh, in um, an indigenous culture to a particular plant base and that can be incorporated into a land valuation um, uh, if lands were improperly seeded and that is um, 
in that is presented as a claim, then the evaluation can incorporate uh, the traditional knowledge and an oral tradition can uh, very much come into play in a negotiations uh, setting. Cool. Thank you for that, Brandon. Um, the, the next question here comes from uh, Sarah Harrison, and it's kind of a two-parter. And I think um, the first part is, well, actually, this was asked during Brandon's um, presentation, but I think this is something that maybe both of you could speak to. Um, so the first part of the question is, um, how long was the Duke of Richmond Governor General of Upper Canada for? And the second question that you both might want to elaborate on is, how did First Nations give assent to transfer of land? Uh, since I think there was no tradition of literacy, but oral histories instead. So how, how does that work in an Indigenous culture that's maybe more uh, based in, in oral, oral tradition and less so in sort of the uh, legalistic, um, you know, kind of that literacy tradition? Um, I'll, I'll let uh, you guys take, take, it, take it away. Well, I'd very much like to hear uh, Michael's uh, take on this, but uh, I'll just give it a shot here first. Um, so the governor, the Duke of Richmond was in um, office as governor general from May of 1818 till August of 1819. Um, how did the Chippewas give assent? Well, they had um, negotiations meetings where various government officials and Indian agents would uh, speak to Indigenous leaders and try to give them a general idea of what was going on. Uh, maps were employed, the historical uh, record shows. Um, there are minutes, especially the 1818 meeting uh, for the Longwood Treaties negotiations where um, various stipulations are presented by the Chippewas um, asking for um, uh, various promises and, and, and trying to get a, uh, a, a, well, essentially a better deal with the British. Uh, you can see in the paper record, the archival record, uh, it's, it appears that the Chippewa chiefs may even be coming a bit more savvy or wise to the British's nonsense over the years of negotiations. Um, so, yeah, very much there are open-ended questions about the ethicality of these agreements, uh, to, to say the very least. But um, uh, they, there were large, there were in-person meetings and visual materials presented. How much that actually uh, um, um, contributed to to a fair deal is is very much up for debate. I I think I, I echo much of what what you said there, Brandon. Um, if perhaps we can break it into the two parts. How did it happen practically um, or, or historically, perhaps a better term? Um, I won't venture beyond sort of the things I presented today, um, but in both the case with the Seneca as well as with the, um, the Chippewa, the Thames First Nations, we can actually see two different processes happening. So with the Seneca, uh, this is presented at a meeting with the American commissioners, and it's a ratification of something that's already happened within the community. So we don't have the record of what happened within the community. Um, in the first instance, we have the colonial retelling of it. And obviously that limits what we can say about the way that these things are negotiated. What we do know is the way that they were communicated to the crown in that case. Um, with the example of the Chippewa uh, and the Fairfield Chippewa deed in 1796, one of the things I would go so far as to venture is that one of the lessons Ebenezer Allen learns is to keep it as hush-hush as he possibly can until he has to bring this before the government. And at that point, he'll be able to make the most convincing case uh, for why the land should be granted to him. So in the case of the 1791 deed, it occurs and is brought before the government almost the same year it happens. And that's in part because of treaty negotiations, but it's also to do with the relationships within the communities. Uh, and in 1796, of course, the deed does not become come before the executive council until 98. And even when it comes before the council in 98 and they reject it, uh, Ebenezer Island stays on the land. In 1804, I believe uh, Lord Selkirk is going through that part of uh, Western Ontario. And he runs into Ebenezer and the Boyes and, and all of the others who are named in the deed. And he says, they're still there. And they're just gonna wait until the land is brought up uh, in treaty negotiation and hope that they get their claims confirmed. So I think that that gets to that sort of second part of it, You know, where's the ethics in this? Certainly we know how they were negotiated in the sense of what they shared with the colonial government, the ethics behind it. Why was Ebenezer Allen allowed to stay? Why did he choose to stay? It's complicated. Uh, one of the things that I didn't have a chance to get into in the presentation is 
another uniting factor, and that's in both uh, the Seneca, or the, in the Genesee Valley and on the Genesee River, and in the Thames River, Ebenezer Allen's initial grants are because he builds a mill. And that scene is being very valuable, both by the colonial governments who are concerned about, you know, how do we support colonization in the area, but also potentially by the indigenous communities who see this as being something that they can use as well. So those are things I'd like to explore a little bit more. Um, they're kind of tangential to, to the point I want to make about kinship, but I think they do shed a lot of light on what was regarded as fair at that time in a way that's a little bit different than uh, a legalistic approach to it. So thank you for your question. I hope I've answered it okay. Thank you very much, um, both of you for, um, I guess, answering that question, sort of expanding on each other's points. That was really good. Um, the next question here, I think, is one that um, you could both probably speak to again. Um, so this question comes from Leslie Taylor. And the question is, um, if you would be able to talk about the status of the land in question uh, for the Fairfield Chippewa deed uh, today. And maybe Michael, you could talk about this maybe for more of the, uh, from what you've uncovered doing your research about that. And since Brandon, you, you're you working, you know, for the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, maybe you could speak of that land um, as well from the sort of that community perspective. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it to you guys once again. Sure, I, I don't mind starting with this one and then I'll, I'll pass it to you, Brandon, if that sounds good. Perfect. So uh, from the historical perspective, of course, in 1820, uh, the land is given to, to both Mary and Chloe. Uh, Mary actually has a mill site, uh, and there is a mill that Ebenezer built there that she sort of inherits. Um, both of the women appear to have left at some point. Uh, Mary appears to go back, actually, to the Genesee Valley uh, and to, I believe, the Buffalo Creek Reserve. I'll have to check my notes. Um, so she does not stay in Upper Canada. And Chloe moves, uh, and I'm assuming sells the land. So by and by, most of what was promised in the deed is not passed on to the children, or they don't get to keep it, at least beyond the 1820s. Now, that's still a 30-year window in which their families have use of the land and the political influence as much as the economic uh, boost that comes from being landowners in the colony. But to my knowledge to this day, there's no uh, current connection uh, to the Chippewa of the Thames uh, First Nation to that land. Um, and Brandon would probably be able to pick that up and, and run with it a little bit more. Um, yeah, no, it, as far as we can tell, I think that uh, pretty well sums it up, Michael. Um, can't, we don't know of any community lineage that uh, legs back um, to, to, to that family, as, as far as I can tell. Um, as far as I, I don't think there was any um, land ceded or privatized resulting from that uh, agreement either. Um, in fact, I'm almost certain there's not. Um, I think it it, it sort of um, is a bit of a outlier historical anomaly, sort of like you know a curious little oddity, but. Um, it, it is really crucial to have a, a comprehensive picture of, of the history of this time, of the legalities and illegalities and the operations and um, ambitious enterprising schemes that were going on in the era. And there could uh, potentially be uh, claims potential if, if, if the government historically did a uh, unlawfully uh, agree to some kind of land arrangement. So it, it exists in that way um, as far as genealogically, uh, and as far as I can tell, there's, there's not much there. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is for Michael specifically. And uh, this one comes from Sarah Harrison. And, um, and it says, Michael, if you would be willing could you expand more on Kaya Shota's speech in 1791 to highlight what, what we can learn about kinship and community relationships in the 18th and 19th centuries? Yeah, uh, thank you. It's a great question, Sarah. And it's, it's a, the, the best answer is gonna be longer than the one I'm gonna give just in the interest of time today. But if you are interested in talking more, I'm, I'm happy to chat more about it. Um, I think it shows us a couple things at a couple different levels, which is what makes it so fascinating to me. Um, you know, I'm, I follow uh, as a student rather than really a scholar of Indigenous history, particularly around the really rich Haudenosaunee history um, that has come out uh, and has been coming out for quite a while in early American history. 
Um, and so I think Kaya showed a speech and the voices of the Seneca women that are filtered through it are a great example of the dynamics uh, within Haudenosaunee communities around uh, control over land, around uh, land sharing relationships and, and all sorts of other internal aspects that folks like Susan Hill have done a really remarkable job of sketching out for historians like me who are trying to piece that together from a very different perspective. Um, it's also, I think, rare that we get to hear the voices of the women. And I think the content of their voices, as much as the presence of their voices in this case, is really important. Um, they're talking about a particularly painful episode uh, in which someone that they had welcomed into the community is no longer behaving by the community norms and violating the great law of peace in the abusive content and uh, the abusive actions that he's visiting on members of the community. So it's a pretty clear uh, instance in which they assert their control uh, and it's indigenous women asserting their control against the settler man, even though he is one who's been adopted uh, and is part of, and it's considered kin with their community. So I think there's layers to unpack there. And, and I don't want to say too, too much more about that because I think it teaches us one other thing. Um, and that is a little bit about how these treaty negotiations and, and the land negotiations are actually being organized between the United States government and uh, indigenous nations during the 1790s. So I flagged the Royal Proclamation and the Trade and Intercourse Act of 1790 and a lot of scholarship on those documents and, and the resultant treaty history is very much from the legal perspective and, and does a lot of work to show us how various individuals within colonial governments and within colonial institutions thought about indigenous rights to land and indigenous control of that land, uh, both pre-treaty and post-treaty. And this is a really clear moment where a lot of theorizing about uh, you know, legal norms or constitutional uh, debates kind of hits a wall. And up against that wall is these ideas of kinship that are being carried by, uh, in this case, Seneca women. And I think that that's a really important thing for historians like myself who are, who are kind of closer to legal history in some ways than indigenous history, or at least started that way, to always be mindful of. So for me, it's just a very powerful primary source document that brings us back to some really important historiographic debates that, that are still ongoing today and that I'm, I'm very glad to listen to and hopefully contribute a little bit to. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for, for expanding on that uh, answer. And uh, you're in the hot seat once again, Michael. Um, the next question comes from uh, Laura Murray, uh, who we, we both know, of course, and who um, has previously uh, given the uh, Queen's Archive uh, lectures as well, uh, last year, I believe. Um, anyway, um, so Laura says, um, so fascinating, Mike, Trying to think through implications or implicit claims. Is it right to say that, quote unquote, respect for Indigenous legal practices and women's legal rights is being manipulated or exploited by Allen and everyone? Does it make sense to see here at once evidence or continuing sovereignty and also a sense that even this could be vulnerability? Uh, can you comment? Yeah, well, hi, Laura. It's great to virtually hear from you um, and, and for the great question. Uh, it's, it's a big question, so I'll kind of try to unpack it in, in its parts here. Um, is Alan manipulating and exploiting these things? 100%. Um, I think one of the fascinating things about this is the events in 1796 paralleling so closely the events in 1791 to the point that we can think of it as a strategy um, and one that you know, is very clearly designed for him to preempt land. Um, I wish I'd included it, uh, but in both cases, the river, uh, the Genesee River or the Thames River is the dividing line between, on the one hand, colonial jurisdiction, and on the other hand, unceded territory, where self-government of indigenous nations is still quasi-recognized by colonial officials. Um, and that's kind of a contentious point, but you know, for the purposes of this, that's certainly the approach they're taking to it. And Alan knows that, and he gets land right on the edge, knowing that he can basically negotiate on the other side of the river with his indigenous kin for, for a grant. And it allows him to make a larger preemption claim based on not only this right to the soil, but also to his ability to improve it. So he, he's kind of doing two things at once here. And one that definitely is, is exploiting um, indigenous ideas of kinship and land sharing. That said, of course, I think the, the, the instance with Joseph Brandt uh, in both of these cases and, and the Seneca chiefs words remind us that you know they have their own reasons for doing these things and Ebenezer Allen is able to maneuver within those but he does not shape the terms. Uh, he can really deal with things on an individual level to a certain degree but it's coming at a much bigger practices and I, I don't ever want to lose sight of those because I think that um, we have enough stories about you know how settlers were able to do x y and z to indigenous communities and yet here we see very clearly uh, 
episodes of resilience that even his manipulations does not undermine. Um, and that kind of ends with uh, this really interesting point you brought up about women's legal rights here. Um, so yes, Ebenezer Allen is exploiting these things. Uh, his daughters end up in a really interesting position. Uh, and Chloe in particular, right after she's granted this land in Caradoc Township, she actually petitions the executive council on her own behalf and in the document refers to herself as an indigenous woman. And she says, you know, this land was given to me, uh, but I'm married and she's married to a settler man who's apparently of particular disrepute. And she recounts that he's stolen all of her cattle and uh, he's fled to the States and she's worried that he's going to try to sell her land out from under her because as a married woman, she does not have sole title to it. And part of the reason I emphasize that she does actually have sole title to it, according to the executive council, is that they make that point clear when they enter her name into the deed and reassure her in response to her petition that the land is exclusively yours. And like Sally and I, like so many other indigenous women we know of, uh, that's just not typically what we expect to happen. So Ebenezer's manipulations allow his daughters to have a sense of security that is, is very rare in colonial society for, for indigenous women before the law especially married ones. Uh, so it, it's messy. And I, I think I said the word messiness at least three times in the presentation. And it's kind of something I'm sticking with because I don't think it's anything that can be teased out. And that gets to that question about sovereignty. How much of this is about sovereignty? A lot depends on how you think about preemption, which is a very naughty legal subject. And uh, I'm sure most people don't want to hear too, too much about it today. But I will say that the ability for the Seneca to govern their land, the ability for the Chippewa to govern their land, the ability to make property out of that land is seen by men like Henry Knox and is seen by particular members of the Executive Council and Upper Canadian officials as being a threat to Upper Canadian sovereignty and to American sovereignty. So, or, or the Crown sovereignty, I should say, not Upper Canada's. But, but it's that threat that I think makes us think about this as Indigenous sovereignty, even if in some ways it's very truncated and even if in other elements the colonial government might you know, say that this is clearly people under their protection, they're no longer independent nations, et cetera, et cetera, whatever legal jargon. So again, happy to talk about it more, Laura, but uh, thank you so much for letting me talk about it now. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you, Mike. And I mean, if, um, you, if you had follow-up questions or, or wanted Michael or Brandon to elaborate on something more, I mean, uh, go back ahead and um, type another question. We have plenty of time still. Uh, this next question comes from Tom Peace, Thomas Peace, um, who thanks you both for your excellent presentations. Um, he says, I love how they demonstrate the need to stitch together colonial archival collections to understand Indigenous histories. Um, I am wondering about the relationship of these records to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty slash Common Pot, as outlined by Lisa Brooks and others. Um, as well as the 1796 St. Anne's Island Treaty. Um, and then specifically um, asks uh, if Michael, uh, if you can talk about how do we situate this deed, um, as well as the example of um, Sally um, uh, Eintz, um, who you referenced in your talk within this treaty context. And then Brandon, um, specifically, how do we bring archives into conversation with broader treaty contexts? So maybe Brandon, if, if you could answer first, maybe speak to this idea of the dish with one spoon, common pot, St. Anne's Island Treaty, and then also that more specific question for you. And then we'll go to Michael. Yeah, so um, in um, regard to St. Anne's Treaty, dish with one spoon, and common pot, these ideas are a little bit outside of my uh, uh, realm of knowledge and but they do come up and uh, in our department we usually uh, uh, refer to uh, Alan Corbier and uh, he's a scholar of, um, of, of of wampum and indigenous tradition and he has a, a great deal of um, well written and um, uh, recorded materials from podcasts and uh, presentations and uh, it's he has a very rich understanding of these matters. He can go between uh, different indigenous languages and English flawlessly. It's very impressive. So I, I, I don't mean to uh, uh, cop out, but that is, we do usually, um, instead of um, 
bringing our, our, our own perspective on that, uh, uh, refer people to, to, to Alan Corbier's materials on, on those uh, matters. Uh, but thank you very much for the question. And I'm sure there's a, there's very um, uh, rich interpretations and takes on, on, on that to be had. It's just a little bit outside of my uh, expertise. Great. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Tom. Um, I, I think I echo Brandon to a certain extent with the uh, questions about the common pod and, and my interpretation of the dish with one spoon literature. Um, and by literature, I mean, obviously, the, the things I've been exposed to through, um, through my research, uh, as opposed to any oral history or, or anything uh, passed to me. Um, broadly, I mean, this, this, this moment where the Haudenosaunee are invited, seemingly, or at least Joseph Brandt, to deal with the um, Boyer family and to protect them, quote unquote, in their sort of rights to the land is, is intriguing to me. Um, and I think you can think of it again at, at two levels. So there is this very individual level where Joseph Brandt's involvement with so many of these cases around Grand River, around leasing and property rights and all sorts of other things, perhaps make him a good individual to have in, in your corner as these are going on. I mean, he gets involved in Sally and Isa's dispute and, uh, and he's sort of around um, in, in a rather important way as a liaison between you know, these two worlds in some extents. And there's an explicit line in that 1800 deed that says, you know, the Chippewa say, quote, we do not know the ways of the white people when it comes to property. And when you think about someone who does, it's certainly Joseph Brandt who understands this, uh, or at least can you know, advocate on, on this point. So I think that's, again, at the very individual level. This great bigger level that you've pointed out with the dish with one spoon and, and common pot metaphors uh, or, or relationships, excuse me, that, that have existed uh, well before the deeds start. Um, I mean, I, I, I think I follow Heidi Boecker's thoughts on this to a certain extent and, and some of her work around kinship networks and dotums. We know that these things existed. Uh, we know that these structures were strong and that they had serious importance in the reorganization of indigenous polities as they moved and, um, and reconstituted themselves in different parts of the Great Lakes, uh, both before and after the American Revolution. So it seems crazy that this wouldn't be part of it. In fact, it seems really unlikely that this wasn't shaping uh, how that process was negotiated, but finding evidence for it in the colonial record is tough. And I'd love to continue to do the research to find, you know, something a little more that, that gestures towards it. But I, I do think that the fact that these negotiations happen time and time and time and time again uh, suggests that there is something greater here about, uh, about how these communities fit together and the Delaware factor into that too, not just the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. And Alan is on land right above where the Delawares are, are settled. And again, perhaps not a coincidence, but something more coherent going on here. Um, to your last point about treaties, uh, I wanna think a little bit more about the particular treaties, but uh, fascinatingly when, when these various bodies are sort of fighting over in the colonial uh, government about whether Alan should be given his land, uh, the Indian department weighs in and says that Ebenezer Allen and Sally and I's are going to be crucial in the negotiation of future treaties because they can liaison on the government's behalf with the indigenous nations that they want to treat with uh, to get land. And in the opinion of the Indian department, it's quite a good bargain to give them a couple hundred acres, a couple thousand acres to get millions. Uh, and so they don't really see a problem with it. So they are, they're deeply involved in the politics of the process, even behind the scenes, outside of the actual negotiations. But I will keep my eye out for, for any more direct connections to the ones you listed there, because they're, they're definitely part of this in some way, shape, or form. So thanks. Sorry, I was on mute. Excellent. Uh, thank you uh, both for your answers there. Um, the, the next question comes from Amy Kaufman, uh, who asks, if you could talk about um, if and how you researched oral history in the context of legal documents and treaties, and this is meant uh, for uh, both of you to answer. So uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but maybe I'll leave it up to you. Um, well, I, I suppose what, one way that you could um, that it is probably re researching and reading court documents themselves. Uh, they, there's surely uh, in, in, in some legal material uh, testimonies from um, Indigenous elders. Um, there are, uh, like I referred to before, uh, land valuations, which would have uh, contributions from uh, Native elders' own experience. Um, there are quite a few recordings, both um, 
of uh, decades and decades ago, older recordings and newer recordings of uh, indigenous elders ex explaining their experiences. Uh, there could be some uh, legal implication in uh, of some of that stuff. I'm not I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really uh, draw it out and speak directly to it. But uh, uh, certainly, there is a rich amount of information which surely would have uh, significance um, to uh, a community, both you know spiritually and uh, presumably legally as well. Um, there are interesting accounts of uh of various individuals one uh, peter jones who was an ojibwe uh, christian missionary in the region and he would go around to communities and he was a very good um uh, keeper of records and uh, documentarian of, of the people he would meet and there's a, a very interesting account that otherwise probably would have just um uh, been forgotten about which he records about uh, a, a debate, a sort of debate he had with a Chippewas of the Thames chief named uh, Kenotong. And uh, it's about the nature of God and theology and Kenotong's thoughts on theology, uh, which are starkly different than uh, Peter Jones's Christian views. Um, and so while there might be, uh, and well, while there is oral traditions, um, uh, well, oral traditions could presumably contribute to uh, legal uh, battles. There's also just uh, a, a spiritual and interest base and, and more abstract uh, meaningfulness that they can also bring to a community and bring to students of history as well. So I, I think that's something which um, the community would be interested in learning about further and thank you very much for your interest because these things these things are very important and oral traditions continue by people absorbing them and passing them down and maintaining that interest so thank you very much thanks amy um i i haven't used oral history in this project um thus far um i don't i don't know if i will uh in a lot of ways i think uh the questions I'm really interested in uh, have, have filtered through in the colonial archive and as someone who kind of focuses on the colonizers and how they think about these things and their relationship to indigenous nations. Um, it hasn't been somewhere I've started, but uh, as I've said, I think about a few things here. This project is still in the works and in, in the framing in a lot of ways, and I would be happy to learn more um, about those those relationships. Um, it, it might very well be kind of a, a thing that helps uh, answer Tom Peace's question there uh, a minute ago about uh, forms of Indigenous land sharing and those relationships. Um, and I will plug because it was a wonderful presentation in 2018, uh, the Queen's Archive Lecture that had again a, a quasi oral history component uh, in a particular document that recorded the uh, oral discussions at treaty negotiations, which upheld the oral history that Indigenous nations had been uh, putting forward. Um, against the written record that the colonial government was using in courts uh, over land claims issues, though I, I admit I forget the exact location. So um, these things find their way even into the colonial archive, and it's something I'm always on the lookout for. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I had a couple questions uh, for our presenters as well, and seeing as we have none lined up in the queue, I might take the opportunity um, to maybe ask uh, Brandon a question. Um, and I want to ask you, Brandon, a question pertaining to the idea of, you know, this idea of the colonial archive and how archives, museums, research libraries are mostly Western slash colonial institutions. And I think what you said in your presentation about collecting archival materials and building a community research collection was interesting. Um, I like the idea of providing a First Nation with increased accessibility to their own histories. And I was wondering if you could elaborate further on how this process is going uh, with the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation. And also, and this is kind of a follow up on the previous question about oral history um, and how, how you, know, you guys are working to incorporate oral traditions and community knowledge into this community based archive. Um, yeah, great question. Thank you. And uh, hopefully I can answer this a little bit more directly. Um, so I showed those pictures of, uh, of my colleague and I giving a seminar in the school. And um, we usually do that at least once a year during Treaty Education Week. Of course, this year was a little bit different. 
Um, but there's a great deal of interest that the students have expressed about engaging with these archival documents, especially in the uh, older years, six, seven, eight. Um, that's an area we ideally we would get in the school and uh, uh, do, do these sort of seminars more often and uh, perhaps look into the future. Uh, we will. Um, so engaging with the youth engagement is important. Um, uh, we've done presentations for uh, the the older people in the community as well and um, for um, um, interested uh, people within the region. Um, there is a in the part of the treaties lands and environment department so there's a bit of a wider range or wide range of disciplines within it and particularly in uh, the environment area uh, they've done a lot of recordings with elders speaking on environmental issues what the land use um, for various things used to be uh, used for and we've been fortunate to acquire some um, recording and uh, uh, drone footage technology which hopefully can uh, be used to have a create a sort of Im image in time of, of of the community and see how it will uh, grow and change over time as well as getting the um well obviously the world has an aging population now so getting as much information from our elders right now is is, is really imperative and it's really valuable for future generations. I think some of the most interesting um, accounts, oral, written, or otherwise, are of people coming from different cultural perspectives and trying to um, understand different perspectives. And in history, you may have seen that from uh, uh, merchants or missionaries or, or whomever. Um, nowadays, things are moving so fast, even um, uh, from a few decades ago, there's a different culture of perspective and culture of overlay than there is now. And uh, interviews with the elders are, are very uh, good at bring, bringing out the uh, the changes in time and changes of, of, of culture. And there, there's a lot incorporated in those um, interviews, even though they they may be short. So interviews with elders and um, and uh, uh, seminars with community members and with interested parties from the region are are just, or some of the ways we're trying to to, to promote a community archive and uh, keep alive oral traditions and knowledge at the moment. Thank you. So I guess a lot of it is just kind of getting out there, um, you know, going to talk to people and recording and recording them basically, right? Yeah, in a, in a, uh, it's an ethical way in, uh, uh, you know, a consent's obviously very important and we've uh, been working away in the community to develop a research protocol um, obviously everything's a little bit slowed with the situation ongoing so um, uh, yeah we, we've we've had uh, in, engagement with with the development of, of something like that as well which will help to ensure that um, these things are done in uh, the, this proper way as possible and um, allows for different perspectives and takes on these matters Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, uh, I have a question for you too. And this is, I guess, kind of close to what you answered when you were answering Tom's piece question that sort of pertained to the dish with one spoon treaty. But I think I'll ask it anyway, because maybe there's a bit of a different angle there. Um, so in your presentation, I noticed you drew on Michael Whitkin's work in reference to a native new world um, that you see coming into being following the American Revolutionary War as many indigenous peoples were displaced by the conflict and uh, the land sessions and how the Haudenosaunee homeland kind of becomes this border, borderland slash bordered land between the British colonies of Upper Canada and Lower Canada and the newly formed United States. Um, just thinking about Michael Wittgen's work, you know, when he uses the term native new world, he is uh, referencing this Anishinaabe Dakota Alliance that cemented a powerful new native social formation uh, west of the Great Lakes uh, that was kind of in reaction to uh, French colonial imperial expansion in, into that region. Um, so how, and in your mind then, how is the world of post-revolutionary Northeastern North America different from the native new world that Wiccan describes? And I guess, you know, following that, can you speak any more to this idea of the kinship connections between the Haudenosaunee or the Seneca and the, and the Chippewa and Anishinaabe? of the Thames River region um, that sort of leads them to recognizing Mary and Chloe as their kin 
by the time we get to the 1796 uh, Fairfield Chippewa deed. Thanks, Scott. Um, it's a it's a big question, and I think my my use of Michael Witkin's term, um, bes besides the obvious differences in some ways between the political formations that are taking shape, um, is in part because I feel like it's a much better uh, label than than Richard White's idea of the middle ground for this space. Um, and I think it captures something that uh, Kathleen Duval's native ground doesn't quite get at. Uh, what I really liked about Wiccan's uh, formulation is that you have this very important element of indigenous polities reconstituting themselves through alliance, through relationship, in reaction to uh, European imperial presence and actions, uh, but, but not in a way that, again, suggests that major change is happening in terms of the nature of those associations. And one of the things that has struck me so much about this project, and, and it goes back to what, what Tom asked, so clearly this is something I'm going to be including uh, in, in, in subsequent versions of this uh, around the Dish with One Spoon conversations, is we are, anyone who's looked at these treaty documents, anyone who's looked at, you know, the records of the Indian Affairs Departments or any of these colonial archival source bases that deal with Indigenous polities and, and, and the way that the American Revolution in particular changed those relationships is, is tripping over kinship. Uh, conversations. And to give just one example, the Delaware, uh, who Alan is settled near, are consistently referred to as being, you know, the younger brothers of various nations, uh, particularly the Haudenosaunee, in, in their relationships. And what I think the Alan Grant uh, deeds let me do is think about that kinship that we typically think of at the individual level as being familial, personal, um, as an aside, I don't really get much much utility out of the idea of fictive kinship in this uh, world, um, which I think is telling that um, about, you know, the persistence of indigenous ideas of kinship and adoption. They're not some fictive thing uh, in the way that, you know, we we have thought about them in the past, but are real uh, forms of kinship as real as as any blood relation. Um, and I see those, you know, both moving up and down between that individual level and that national level. And I think that that is what's structuring in some ways the reformulations of you know the dish with one spoon or the common pot that I think become something like a native new world uh, in the way that Wickham discusses it. Although obviously there are huge differences. Number one being uh, violence is not really present in this world in the same way. And the quasi imperial power is a much more immediate presence though a much less violent presence in the sense of you know individual interactions but in a sustained way they are quite literally at the doorstep and are pushing daily and dispossessing uh, with every treaty uh, yearly so that 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 is a, a significant difference to it but uh, I think I think yeah that's that's part of why I'm trying to think alongside those frameworks to try to capture a lot of the things we've been talking about that I find Michael Wicken has done the best job at doing. Excellent thank you and I, I think I get what you're saying too like you to understand these treaties you need to understand these kinship terms, uh, terminology that kind of comes with them, right? Um, so we have um, uh, another question, and this one's for you again, Michael. And this is from Sarah Harrison, uh, again, who, who thanks you uh, once again for both of your fascinating speeches. And um, she was wondering about the, uh, the dish with one spoon wampum belt um, and how, uh, Michael, in your talk, you mentioned the fact that Ebenezer Allen stole a wampum belt from the Haudenosaunee and that he went to jail for it. Um, and then Sarah asks, what does that say, Michael, about Crown Indigenous relations with land session? So, so if you could talk more about the stolen wampum belt and then the dish with one spoon as sort of represented on a, as a treaty on a wampum belt as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you again, Sarah. Um, I'm going to try to make the connection, and, and I, I think it might be a little bit rough just because we don't really know too, too much about the wampum belt in particular that Ebenezer Allen stole. Uh, but from what Joseph Brand's protests about it say when he reaches Congress, and it's made clear to him that this has arrived uh, without the uh, acknowledgement of the Haudenosaunee, and more particular without his acknowledgement because there are very complicated Haudenosaunee politics going on in the aftermath of the American Revolution. Um, Joseph Brandt is, is furious and makes very clear that they will never send a white man with a wampum belt. That's just not the way that this is going to work. Uh, and he wants Congress to understand that. He then works with the British to imprison Allen because at the Treaty of Fort Stantwick, again, we have this really important moment where Haudenosaunee politics is working itself out 
both against and kind of independently of the American um, treaty negotiations and, and the uh, land sessions that are trying to be filtered through um, within the communities and, and outside of them. So uh, again, lots of layers to this. So I think I would say that in terms of Allen's jailing, um, I think what it tells us about the Crown and Indigenous relations vis-a-vis -vis land sessions is that they really do see at this moment that Brandt is a potential uh, ally and, and a potential person they want to keep uh, in their wheelhouse. And I think that's that's pretty well established in the secondary literature. It's a very utilitarian idea. And that that's a thread, again, that runs through all of this. Um, respect for Indigenous property rights serves the colonial government in one way or another. And the laws might limit how that's interpreted, but at the end of the day, that is that is a big part of it. Um, as for the District 1 spoon element and what that, that might tell us about uh, the wampum belts there, I mean, I think it, it shows, again, a, a point that, that this, what has sometimes been called forest diplomacy, and the importance of wampum um, is, is obviously something that colonial um, agents are, are very aware of and participating in, too. Um, in particular, Ebenezer Allen's idea to steal it uh, shows that he knows exactly what he's doing. Um, and, and the kind of rumor, Ebenezer Allen is a man around whom rumor circulates as much as fact. Uh, the rumor is that so powerful was this gesture um, and so deeply uh, significant was the wampum belt of peace that was sent to Congress that the Haudenosaunee were forced to basically give in to US demands uh, and that he kind of completely messed up their process of negotiating after the American Revolution. And that's sort of interpreted why he's imprisoned at Stantwick because he's this, you know, rascal that, that can't be trusted to not inject his own interests into the negotiation. But of course, everyone has interest in negotiation and Ebenezer's ended him up in prison. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I don't think that gets to the dish with one spoon element as well as I'd like to, but again, my email is open. <laughs> uh, that's very good. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, next, we have a question uh, for both of you um, from our colleague in the history department, uh, Stephen Maynard. Um, who, oh, there we go, who asks, uh, or rather says, first of all, thanks so much for your presentations to both of you. Um, you've mentioned the colonial archives several times, and I think your work shows so clearly the political possibilities of using those archives against themselves, as it were. If, that, if this is true, how has your work led you to think about the nature of the uh, colonial archive? And I'll let you both have a shot at this. I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, Brandon's unmuted, so. Yeah, no, that's, um, thank you for the question. That's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. And yeah, there, there is a bit of an irony with um, land claims against the Crown being um, built from documents at Crown institutions. Uh, but I, I do, of course, there's a long way to go and I don't uh, want to overstate anything, but, there does seem to be a receptiveness amongst um, um, government employees in the archives, uh, negotiators, and um, of various people that, do, that, that are willing to help put these claims together. There seems to be um, a relationship that, that, that seeks to, to have a more negotiative than co combative way of dealing with things to come to resolu uh, resolution and to have um, a, sort of a diplomatic relationship between uh, between nations. And uh, that, that sort of nation to nation diplomacy goes back a long way. And it's, um, it's uh, you know, humbling for me to be part of the continued um, uh, presence of that. And um, well, there is, a, yeah, like the irony I mentioned un underlying it and that you've identified, um, it is heartening to see how um, um, helpful and committed um, to Indigenous issues um, many of these institutions have become, and uh, hopefully we can continue in that route and have a more reconciliatory uh, relationship as time goes on. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I use the term colonial archive a lot, and uh, I should probably make it plural because, of course, we're talking about multiple colonial archives in, in many places. And, you know, to kind of bring back to what my map was trying to get us to see is it, it doesn't really have a rhyme or reason from a historical basis why some of these items have, have gone to where they are. And it, it really is why the work that Brandon's doing is so important. It's because we need to pull some of this back together um, and reassemble 
a kind of colonial archive, because obviously th that is what these documents are. Um, many almost exclusively that I have used are produced by colonial actors and individuals we would identify as settlers. Um, but in the construction of, of what I think Brandon is building and what I think the, the deed really forced me to do is to realize how the disruption of the categories that sometimes organize our archive in a very practical way, um, from finding guides to, to phones, to you know, the things that are available online, uh, they allow us to make a different kind of colonial archive, maybe one that is more vulnerable to the kind of questions we wanna to put to it and the kind of changes we want to see in a contemporary society. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that, like Brandon rightly said, has, has a very long way to go. Um, I'm, I've been very heartened in this process by how many archivists have been willing to scan pages of documents that, you know, I was sort of on a whim hoping would be there and, and ended up being there. Um, and with the digitization of so many uh, documents like the Indian Affairs uh, records that have allowed this sort of research to happen. And I think the archive is so many things and it's assemblage, but it also is exactly what we do with it. And uh, I think that that's, that's a good thing for, for the future of, of archives and, and both the profession of archivists and, and of historians. Thank you very much, um, both of you. And that was the last question we have in the queue. Um, so uh, I, I'll pass it over to Ken in a second, but I just wanted to personally thank uh, Michael and Brandon one more time uh, for sharing their very interesting research, um, you know, in this sort of online form. I was, I was very interested to learn about, you know, both of their research myself. And of course, they gave me advanced copies of their presentations so I could see as well. So I also enjoyed reading them. But uh, thank you very much. And um, on that note, um, Ken, I will uh, pass the floor uh, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. And I just want to give a really special thank you to our speakers and to our moderator. Uh, the, the the talks were tremendous, uh, very interesting, and and of course the the moderation of Scott was was it just helped to tease out more of this information, more of the context around the talks. Uh, um, Michael mentioned one of our other gems in the archives, the McMartin Diary, which. Uh, document some of the, the conversations around the Treaty 9, the James Bay Treaty. Uh, McMartin was a uh, Ontario uh, uh, treaty negotiator, and uh, that was the subject of the 2018 Annual Archives Lecture. Uh, my colleague Heather Holm also mentioned to me that uh, Peter Jones' son went to Queen's and is the first Indigenous MD in Canada. So I just want to thank everyone for your forbearance with the initial technical difficulties and also for all your really excellent questions that really helped us to bring out more of the context around these presentations. I think it was a, a, a just a great question and answer period. I'd also like to thank, again, the Geraldine Grace and Maurice Alvin Waters Visiting Fellowship, which supported Brandon's research, as well as the members of that fellowship advisory committee, um, Heather Holm, Carolyn Smart, Duncan McDowell, and Stephen Maynard. Uh, due to the pandemic, we won't be hosting another McWaters Fellow in 2021, but we will be offering two fellowships in 2022. And these fellowships allow external researchers to come to Kingston and work in the archives for about a month. And we work to get them involved in campus activities to, to share their research and expertise with faculty and students. So it really does form this sort of virtuous circle of um, research and engagement and teaching and learning and sharing. I'd also like to thank uh, Heather Holm and Lisa Gervais in the archives uh, with uh, uh, lecture preparation and other members of the archives team for reviewing our invite list, our annual our annual review of that list, um, and to the folks in the Discovery and Technology Services uh, team in the Queen's University Library, uh, Judy Young, Lucy Lloyd Batts, and Kim Dixon for getting us up and running with a Zoom webinar for the first time. Believe it or not, this was our first kick at the can with this. Uh, also like to thank uh, Jennifer Amos, uh, Raquel Devison, and Kim Bell. Where, uh, Jennifer did the uh, tremendous um, poster for the session and they all help to um, communicate and amplify our social media about the lecture. And also to the, the library's leadership team, uh, Sandra Morden, uh, Courtney Matthews and our university librarian, Math uh, Michael Vandenberg. Um, you know, we, we decided to go with this new, uh, new technology to host this event in this way. And, and I think it's, it gives us the opportunity for next year to do some kind of hybrid model. 
So we appreciate your time and interest today, and we look forward to seeing you virtually and in person in the fall of 2021 for the 39th Annual Archives Lecture, where we will be able to share uh, more research based on the archival holdings at Queen's University. So thank you all again, and I wish you a very good evening.